I studied filmmaking in the U.S. during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Greetings. It is my great pleasure to interview an activist and insightful author that deciphers very well the hypocrisy of our time. Stephen Goins, the Canadian author and thinker, is our next guest. Watch this interview that has been conducted from my home in Tehran. Stephen Gowans is a Canadian independent political analyst whose principal interest is in who influences the formulation of foreign policy in the United States. He used to write a regular column for Canadian content and is a frequent contributor to the Media Monitors Network. His writings, which appear on his What's Left blog, have been reproduced widely in online and print media in many languages and have been cited in academic journals and other scholarly works. Gowans has consistently been an invaluable chronicler of contemporary events and history. He also has made curiously reactionary arguments on topics like immigration. Gowans is the author of three acclaimed books, Washington's Long War on Syria, 2017, Patriots, Traitors and Empires, The Story of Korea's Struggle for Freedom, 2018, and his most recent one, Israel, A Beachhead in the Middle East. 2019. All of these books have been published by Baraka Books. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity, uh, Mr. Goins. And, um, I've been reading your articles and uh, your, your books, basically your book reviews. Um, let me begin um, with this question. You're now in Canada. Um, where did your activism start? Where did you think that somebody has to start speaking up? And this is not only you. There's a very large and increasing number of intellectuals like yourself who are activists, actually, trying to inform the, the, the larger population about what is really going on with the, with the mass propaganda against the reality of what's going on. Let me just begin, where in your process did you realize uh, that you have to speak out and just the beginning of that and what incident sparked that? I suppose the major incident that sparked it, uh, that precipitated my activism in my intense interest in this, although I've always been interested in foreign affairs. But my intense interest was sparked by the NATO war on Yugoslavia in 1999, uh, a war in which Canada participated robustly and boasted about, boasted about its participation, boasted about um, the number of uh, air missions that had flown that essentially boasted about uh, the number of people it had killed. Uh, this was an unprovoked aggression that was a uh, contravention of international law. Um, and I found that, well, I, I mean, that galvanized me to look more closely into the kinds of aggressions and um, uh, that the United States, that Canada, that the Western world was undertaken. Um, and it spurred a more intense uh, study of U.S. foreign policy in particular and what drives it. So that was it. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, and, and you've, you've dealt with the different, different subjects and different, different topics in your books. 
But what was the next step? Uh, okay, after this revelation, and I, and I was in Bosnia in 92, I did, I did a documentary uh, about the siege of Gorazde. So I was a little familiar, and also the fact that the entire UN force surrounded Gorazde, but never entered it, never helped the people. They, the UN was very well aware of the catastrophe of the siege by the Serbs and did nothing about it. It was a very clear scenario. Uh, you could see it on the grounds, and I, I saw it, and I recorded it. So I, I understand that, and I think that um, uh, it was a very a naked scene of what the whole thing is about and what, how the UN is more a show than a force for, uh, for the righteous or for justice. I really saw that. Um, um, but I will continue just by what was next on your agenda that pushed you into writing and informing, or informing the, the white public? I suppose anyone with a modicum of intelligence who is interested in international affairs and follows Western media will very quickly discover that what they're being told just doesn't make sense. And perhaps that was what galvanized me the most to try and make sense of what was actually going on because the world which was being presented to me was not a world that made sense. I mean, just to use a current example, I was reading the, the Wall Street Journal this morning, or you read any Western media this morning about what's happening with the US relationship with Iran. I mean, this relationship is depicted as one in which the United States is being threatened by Iran. And yet anyone with any modicum of intelligence who's followed this would see that the story is completely turned on its head. Um, so it's that kind of thing that really stimulated me uh, and, and got me interested. So principally, I'm interested in um, foreign policy from the perspective of the United States, not only in opposing that foreign policy, simply for the sake of opposing it, but also understanding where it comes from, what its origins are, what drives it, what factors shape it. Uh, because uh, if you're opposed to it, if you find it morally reprehensible, and if you want to put an end to it, you have to understand what drives it in order to effectively oppose it. In your book, which is interesting, uh, you write a book about Israel. It's called Israel, a Beachhead in the Middle East. Um, I, I looked up the word beachhead in the dictionary because I hadn't quite understood the meaning, and it's a military strategic meaning about the beachhead um, and you focus on Israel. Uh, tell, me, tell me about that, that angle that you take, which is sort of brave that people don't talk about Israel that fluidly right now. It's brave actually in two, uh, two respects. Um, there are people who talk about Israel and this book is kind of a reply to them. Um, there are people uh, in fact, you had a guest on your show not too long ago who was talking about Israel and was trying to explain the relationship between the United States and Iran and suggesting that the only reason the United States has a hostile relationship with Iran or an attitude to Iran is because of Israel. My book is a reply to that kind of argument. It said it has nothing to do with Israel. U.S. foreign policy isn't driven by Israel. There's a view that it, the, the Israelis are somehow manipulating Washington, you know, and they're running U.S. foreign policy from behind the scenes. Um, that's not my argument. I make, in fact, I argue against that point when I talk about a beachhead in the U.S. Or in the Middle East. Israel has, from its inception, and in fact, the Zionist movement, the political Zionist movement, has presented itself as a platform for, by which Western power could be projected into the Middle East, by which you know, the Occident could be projected into the Orient. They deliberately, the Zionists, like, uh, or the political Zionists, in, originally and deliberately sought an alliance with some kind of Western power that would sponsor its settler colonial project in Palestine. And in return for that sponsorship, it would look after Western interests. Well, over time, I mean, the initial sponsor of the, the Zionist political Zionist movement was Britain. 
uh, and then France became a sponsor. And then in 1967, and since 1967, the United States has sponsored this settler colonial project and has used Israel as a platform to project US influence into the Middle East. Um, so as someone said, reviewing the book, their description of the theme of the book was that the tail does not wag the dog, that Israelis do not control US foreign policy. The United States controls its own foreign policy and uses Israel as an instrument of that policy uh, to you know, project its own influence and to pursue its own goals. Uh, and U.S. goals are, of course, expansion, expansion across the world, expansion of the U.S. frontier, projection of U.S. political, economic, ideological influence throughout the world. What is this, just continuing that same line, what is this obsession about Iran being uh, an ex existential threat uh, to almost everyone? Yes, um, and I, I mean, there are various ways to think about that, but I mean, one of the ways uh, I found that really kind of encapsulates or summarizes why it's seen as a threat. Um, Jim Mattis, the former U.S. Secretary of Defense, was said to believe, well, First of all, Mattis w was of the belief that uh, the biggest threat to U.S. national security said the three biggest threats are Iran, Iran, and Iran. Well, why was that? Well, he explained one of the advantages of listening to Mattis was that he could, he's sometimes quite honest, he said that the United States believes it needs to have a strong hegemonic position in the Middle East. And if your aim is hegemony in the Middle East, then Iran will be your number one foe because Iran insists on its independence. Um, and it's a large, well, a large country within the context of the Middle East, um, a country which rejects the idea of US hegemony, re rejects the idea of what you might call the international dictatorship of the United States or which the United States euphemizes as world leadership. Um, so it's in that sense that Iran is a threat to the United States. It's a threat to the United States. It's a threat to the U.S. empire simply because it asserts its own sovereignty and insists on independence. Um, the United States uh, is allergic to, it's inimical to countries or any kind of movement that uh, insists on self-directed development and independence and sovereignty. Um, so, you know, the United States is not only hostile to Iran, it's been hostile to any country that's tried to assert independence. And today that would be Venezuela, that would be North Korea, um, there are another, uh, Libya, uh, uh, the countries that were on the, the, uh, the axis of evil lists, you know, North Korea, Iran, Iraq, and then there was Libya and Cuba added to the list, uh, and Syria. And uh, when you look at the hostility of the United States, I mean, the hostility of the United States to Iran originally, I mean, originates in 1979. It's from that point that we see a very hostile policy toward Iran. And this is attributed to the fact that in 1979, Iran extricated itself from the U.S. orbit and uh, achieved sovereignty and independence from the United States. From that point forward, the United States has been trying to reabsorb Iran into its orbit, into its empire. Um, and it's from that point forward that many policies of the United States toward Iran shift radically. For example, on nuclear energy. Uh, prior to 1979, the United States was facilitating the development of a nuclear energy industry in Iran. In 1979, that stops and the United States attempts to hinder Iran's acquisition of uh, nuclear uh, or a nuclear energy industry. Um, so it's often said that uh, there are some people in the, in the West believe mainly because this is the way in which Western media portray it, that, uh, um, that the conflict between Iran and the United States is one that centers on 
uh, Iran's attempt to acquire nuclear um, uh, energy or to uh, enrich uranium, uh, when indeed that's really not the center of the conflict. The center of the conflict is uh, Iran's insistence on sovereignty and independence. And enriching uranium on one's own soil is also an expression of independence. Uh, it's a way of becoming economically independent, for example, not depending on other countries to provide you with enriched uranium for uh, nuclear power plants, for example. Right. You know, you have, you have a very interesting article, uh, an old article, U.S. aiming for more than nuclear deal in Iran, which I think was very pertinent to many different points. But I want to uh, bring your attention to this one thing that, you know, you, why should Iran prove, I'm, I'm asking your opinion, why does Iran have to prove that it's not a nuclear threat? Uh, I think this, this whole paranoia is a fake paranoia that they've developed to cover up that attack they have on the sovereignty of Iran, which began in 1979. This whole thing is it's a quagmire, and we, 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 we've been sucked into it, into the nuclear deal. We have to prove that, no, we're not acquiring a nuclear weapon, although we have a religious fatwa against nuclear weapons by Imam Khomeini and uh, Imam Khamenei against this. It's, it's like getting up in, at dawn and doing a prayer. It's as stringent as, as doing that. Uh, why do we have to prove to the West that we are good people, we are good guys, and that, uh, you know, be, be at peace, don't be paranoid? Why do we have to prove that? Why, why this, who came up with this concoction of paranoia about Iran being a nuclear threat? I mean, where in heaven, how could Iran be a nuclear threat? Uh, where it, um, it doesn't make sense because it was never in our agenda to be a nuclear threat, but they came up with it and they pushed us into a nuclear uh, deal table and we obeyed during the Obama era. We came, our people came. Why do we have to prove that we're good guys? Yeah, so the United States has a number of issues with Iran um, and they're not legitimate issues at all. The issues are Iran asserting its sovereignty and its independence. So the United States from 1979 has had these problems with Iran, uh, support for Hezbollah, for Hamas, for Islamic Jihad, for Syria, uh, development of ballistic missiles, essentially development of the means of self-defense. Somehow Iran is supposed to be denied the means of self-defense because self-defense is then you know, portrayed as being aggressive rather than self-defensive. So uniquely, Iran cannot have self-defense. Iran cannot have ballistic missiles. Uh, but these are these issues that the United States has with Iran. It's uh, asserting its independence. It has an independent foreign policy. And these have always been at the heart of U.S. hostility toward Iran. And the U.S. project toward Iran is eventually to change the government, to change the government to one that will uh, essentially do the bidding of the United States. And the way to achieve that um, is through intimidation, but also mainly through economic strangulation. So the United States has imposed upon Iran sanctions since 1979. Now, the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. I mean, this is now becoming widely misunderstood everywhere. I mean, this was presented and understood by people as some, or the United States arriving at some kind of modus vivendi with Iran. And this certainly hasn't been the case. Even if you read some news reports now, they talk about, well, you know, under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of, of Action, the sanctions were lifted. Well, some sanctions were listed lifted, the UN sanctions were lifted, but the United States continued to maintain its sanctions on the grounds that there were other issues that the United States had with, with Iran, with ballistic missiles, with support for Syria, with support for uh, Hezbollah. So they're going to continue to maintain the sanctions. Plus, they're going to continue to financially isolate uh, Iran. And as a result of that financial isolation, despite the fact that the UN Security Council 
sanctions were lifted, um, the United States essentially continued to disrupt the flow of trade and economic activity or, or uh, Iran's economic connections with the outside world. So since 1979, the United States has been strangling Iran economically in the same way it strangles uh, Venezuela economically and Cuba economically and North Korea uh, with the intention of, well, with multiple intentions, the intention eventually of trying to change the government, the intention of hobbling its development and keeping it weak, uh, and the intention of making an example of it to other countries that might want to ex express their own sovereignty. If you want to express your sovereignty, well, this is what happens to you. We're going to put our foots on your, our feet on your, your windpipe and we're going to strangle you. Um, but how do you justify that? How do you mobilize public support for this kind of hostile and aggressive policy? Well, the only way to do that is to depict the victim as an aggressor. So now we talk about, oh, Iran is, is trying to develop nuclear weapons or it can never be allowed to develop nuclear weapons. Well, you can interrogate that and say, why? Yeah, I mean, how do you justify your aggressive policy toward the victim is by portraying the victim as the aggressor. Um, so Iran has to be portrayed as being uniquely threatening uh, to the United States. And the whole idea that Iran would threaten the United States is completely absurd. Anyone who believes that uh, can't be of the right mind. Um, then we have to, but of course there's a possibility that people might find that argument to be untenable. So then you have to invoke the idea that Iran is a unique threat to Israel. Uh, and the United States uses Israel a lot to do that. I mean, to justify its intervention in the United States, it will invoke threats to Israel as, um, you know, motivating or necessitating a U.S. Uh, supervision of the region. Um, so we have to, to, to depict Iran as being a threat to Israel. Uh, and if it's not a threat to Israel, then it's a threat perhaps to Europe and can't have ballistic missiles because it's going to put nuclear weapons on top of ballistic missiles and send them hurtling to Europe. Why it would do that, who knows? I mean, it, you just have to present Iran or the victim. It's not only Iran, but I mean, Venezuela and North Korea and Cuba, they all get treated in, in Syria and Syria treated in the same way as some kind of threats to um, the physical safety of people in the West. Of course, none of these countries are threats to the physical safety of people in the West, but they are threats to perhaps the economic interests of certain elite groups within the United States. Uh, and they're threats to those economic interests because they also insist on economic sovereignty and economic independence. And the, why is the public as a whole, and forget the public, even the, these different governments that have come these uh, in the U.S. Sh so short-sighted. Um, I have the answer to that, and I'm just asking, how can they not forget that during these past four decades, one of the first things they did after 1979 was support Saddam Hussein? Wasn't, isn't that clear enough evidence of the fact that everything is off track uh, and when it comes to foreign policy towards Iran, is the American public so short-minded, short, short-sighted short in, in, in memory that they forget that the, uh, the U.S. was full-fledged behind Saddam Hussein all those eight years? And that um, where, was, where was the conscious at that time? And since then also we've had the, the same pattern until right now as we're talking. Um, Where's, where's the conscience of, of the public or the administrations? I mean, where are the people, where are the good old Americans who, you, you know, you, in the schools you were taught about democracy and Thomas Jefferson and, and you know, the, 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 whole, the whole myth about what made America great and what Trump is after, Let, let's make America great again. Where's, why is that memory faded away so quickly? about how the whole thing started with Iran in the first place. The first decade was the U.S. administration full-fledged behind Saddam Hussein. I mean, this sort of thing, uh, Mr. Gowan, I'm just saying, 
where is where is the where is the justice? Where is the conscience? How can people be so um, uh, so shallow in, in in thinking and and portray Iran as an imminent threat, as an existential threat? Um. Well, you're right. I mean, it's because the public awareness and knowledge of, of this is very slight. Um, and the public's manipulated. It's manipulated uh, in, in politicians and, and figures of state manipulate in the media, manipulate public perception quite easily. Um, if you follow critically, media reports, um, you can start to see the hypocrisy very easily and the inconsistencies very easily, but it persists because most people aren't really paying that much attention. Um, so, for example, I mean, if we want to talk about Syria, for example, and we talk about Western intervention in Syria is inspired by some kind of democratic values and liberal democracy, uh, well, at the same time, robustly supporting a country like Saudi Arabia. People don't seem to see the disconnect. I mean, you can't support Saudi Arabia unconditionally. And then at the same time saying that you are promoting values of democracy and liberal democracy around the world. And that's the reason why you're intervening in Syria. Um, or in Canada, for example, uh, the Canadian government is engaged in a campaign to essentially uh, overthrow the elected president of Venezuela, uh, Maduro. Um, and the Canadian government presents itself as a great champion of liberal democratic values and justifies its intervention in Venezuela on those grounds, while at the same time selling billions of dollars of uh, you know, armored vehicles to the internal security services of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia so that it can crack down on internal dissent and particularly on the Shia population. Um, so this is entirely inconsistent, but most people don't really follow these issues very closely uh, or notice the inconsistencies, or if they do notice the inconsistencies, they don't really know what to do about it. Let me fast forward to the recent incident with the drone, uh, Iran bringing down the U.S. sophisticated drone. What was, in your opinion, the significance of that incident? What became more apparent after that, do you think? What became more apparent? Yes. Well, I noticed uh, apropos of what we were talking about, is Iran being presented as the aggressor in the Wall Street Journal this morning. There is an article talking about how the shooting down of the drone was an expression of Iranian aggression. Uh, despite the fact, I mean, it's, we can lay aside the question of, I, I mean, there's a dispute about whether the drone actually violated Iranian airspace or not. If it did, obviously, Iran is within its rights to shoot down a drone. I mean, the United States cannot fly drones anywhere it wants, but it claims the right to be able to do that. It claims the right to be able to occupy one third of Syria contrary to international law, for example. No one seems to be raising much objection about that. So it probably would claim the right to be able to violate Iranian airspace. I mean, Israel routinely violates the airspace of Lebanon. We don't hear much complaint about that. Um, and Israel as an extension of the United States apparently claims the right to be able to do that. If the drone hadn't actually violated Iranian airspace, but it had been shot down. Well, this is predictable. Um, what would happen if, if the hostile hegemon, well, not hegemon, the hostile power was flying drones along the periphery of US airspace? Well, you might predict at some point that one of them is going to get shot down. And Iran is, you know, completely surrounded by hostile US forces. I mean, we have uh, the Fifth Fleet in Bahrain, not too far away from Iran. Uh, we have U.S. warships with, within the Persian Gulf. Um, so the fact that uh, there should be some kind of 
uh, every once in a while, these kinds of encounters is really not that surprising. But the US view will still be, and the US view presented in the media, presented by the state, that the United States somehow has a right to be present there. In fact, there, were, there was another article in, in the New York Times or the, the Wall Street Journal this morning about how it is that the United States should assume the leadership role to provide protection uh, for the free flow of oil through the Persian Gulf, that it, it, it ought to accept that leadership role as if the world is begging it to do so and enumerating all of the reasons why the United States has to accept their leadership role. And at the end, what were the reasons? The reasons were so that the United States can control the world economy, so that the United States can superintend the global order. And if you don't want to be part of the United States global order, well, we'll do to you what we're doing to Iran and what we're doing to Venezuela and what we're doing to North Korea. I, we, we've been watching the reflections of it worldwide. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we seem to, everybody's in anticipation of the next havoc that might unfold. And no one knows. And recently, the British held a, a ship with Iranian oil in it. Um, do you have any yourself, any predictions about what might unfold? Um, yes. But uh, just before I go there, I go to the, the incident of the British inter interdicting the ship in uh, was going by the Strait of Gibraltar. This one seems really extraordinary to me because this is an instance of piracy. That's what it is. Um, and yet it's interesting the way it's presented in Western media. It's just kind of passed over as some kind of inconsequential event. And the argument the British are making, which is that they're simply enforcing EU sanctions, is also extraordinary. Since since when do EU sanctions apply to Iran? <laughs> I mean, it, it's just extraordinary. It's an instance of international piracy. Uh, if any other country, if Iran did something like that, we'd hear no end of it. Uh, and this would be grounds for some kind of punishment to be meted out against Iran. Um, so where is this going? I think if you look at this in a broader perspective, in a longer term perspective, um, it'll just continue the way it always has. The United States goal is to deny Iran its sovereignty to deny its independence and to do so by changing its government. And um, I don't think that the United States is going to undertake a full scale military assault on Iran the way it did against Iraq because Iran isn't weak enough, but it'll continue to try to weaken Iran through its ongoing program of economic warfare or economic terrorism as it's called by the Iranian foreign minister, which some might see as being um, perhaps uh, hyperbolic, but I don't think so. I mean, it is economic terrorism. If you define terrorism, and it is defined as harm to or threat of harm to civilians for political ends, then that's precisely what the economic sanctions are that the United States has imposed on Iran since 1979. It is an economic terrorism because the intention is to harm civilians, and it does harm civilians. And it harms civilians with the intention of bringing about a change in government, so as a political purpose. Um, so that will continue. And the United States will continue to attempt to weaken Iran, to weaken it to the extent that it will eventually topple or that it will be able to intervene militarily to topple the government. Um, this, this is my last question. And if I have left out something which you wanted to pronounce, if there's an issue, uh, could you contribute that? Um, in, in thinking about some of the about Iran over the last few days, I, I, one of the things that struck me that I'd kind of missed and that maybe many people have missed is the continuity of US foreign policy, because there's a lot of talk now about how Trump's policy is different from Obama's because Trump has rejected the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action and he's thrown it out. And this is a different approach. 
but I don't think it is a different approach. It's just a difference in degree. You can think about the Trump approach as one of maximal pressure, which is the way in which they describe it. The Obama approach wasn't radically different. The Obama approach was an approach of pressure, perhaps not as much pressure as the Trump administration is imposing, but pressure nonetheless, despite the fact that there was a joint comprehensive plan of action. Uh, as I mentioned previously, most of the US sanctions continued to apply. And the US goal still was to strangle Iran, to pressure it until it uh, essentially accepted a U.S. leadership over the region or an international dictatorship of the United States. Um, so the only thing I would emphasize is to look at U.S. policy over the longer term rather than, you know, what's happening this month versus what happened six months ago. Uh, the policy doesn't change radically, even though we have a change in government, a change in administration, maybe a change in emphasis here and there, the policy remains the same. Uh, interesting that uh, Michael Moore said on uh, the anniversary of September 11th, he said uh, that probably he speculated that Trump might be the last president of the US. How wild is that? <laughs> the last president of the US? <laughs> <laughs> One could only hope. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Goins. It was a pleasure talking to you, and uh, God bless you. Hope to speak to you in the future again. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you for watching the show. See you next time, and God bless you.